I'm Shell McDonald. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, and I teach a metabolism course where we're focusing on energy metabolism. So creatine is a derivative of amino acids, and the purpose of creatine in the body is that it acts as a buffer for our energy stores. We use energy in the form of ATP. And creatine, when it is phosphorylated, which means that we add a phosphate group to it covalently, um, it becomes a buffer for our ATP stores and our energy stores. We store it mainly in our muscle. Those are where we primarily find um, creatine and phosphocreatine, its phosphorylated form. And humans get that naturally when we eat red meats because other animals also store creatine in their muscles. So what happens when our ATP levels start to dip down a little bit, when we start to exercise, we bring them back up right away. We want to maintain homeostasis, or in other words, we want to maintain constant levels of ATP. We never want our cells to be deprived of ATP. So that's where the phosphocreatine and the creatine come in, and they can resynthesize or reform the ATP that's been lost. So the idea with creatine supplementation is that if we ingest that exogenously, or we take or we consume these supplements as consumers, that increases our creatine levels in our muscles and part of that will become phosphorylated, about 60% of it will become phosphorylated. So uh, it means that we can improve our energy buffer stores. So that means that we can exercise for a longer period of time. So that's why it's known as an ergogenic aid. So ergo means to work and um, exercise and performance competitions, that's work. And so if we can improve our um, phosphocreatine buffers, it means that we can buffer our energy for a longer period of time. This is only important during high intensity type of exercise activity like sprints or a really quick run or a swim that's short but brief, so brief and very intense. So there have been lots of studies and that have shown that it's effective but also lots of studies that have shown that it's not effective and that depends on the nature of the study, the nature of the protocol and the type of activity. So a lot of times in the literature um, we're comparing apples and oranges with the science. Um, so for every study that shows that there is a positive effect, there's also a study that shows there's a negative effect or no effect at all. Um, it's a very popular aid. Um, people can access it very easily through health food stores. Um, and, and people think of it as being natural because our body already consumes it or already produces it and already naturally has it. But it's also very expensive, so it's very costly. Um, so you can you can supplement with creatine, and it, it will help your performance. Um, you can lift more weights, for example, as another type of activity where foster creatine is beneficial because it's sort of a short, intense burst of activity. Creatine supplementation is typically done for a short period of time. So um, 10 grams per day for five days is one of the common protocols that we see. Um, and you would only do that for five days. Some of the studies have showed longer term use, but with no added benefits. Um, so you, it's not something you do on the long term, and so we don't typically anecdotally see any negative side effects. You can get some muscle swelling because when you're adding something like a solute like creatine, um, it increases the osmotic pressures in the cell. Mm -hmm. And so people think, oh, I started taking creatine for a few days and I can already feel that my muscles are sort of big. It's just sort of water that's actually just swelling because of this increased load that you have with the creatine supplementation. But it's in the payoff. Do you see a performance improvement? But there's different protocols. As I said, usually it's on the short term. Um, sometimes you will do a loading phase for a few days and then you will do a maintenance phase for a few more days. Um, but the most common one is people will do 10 grams for five days as I mentioned. That's sort of the classic protocol. Okay, so at rest, we're just sitting here at rest. Our muscles aren't active. We're not exercising. And so we use mainly fat at rest. And the, when we burn fats, that's enough to meet the demand for ATP. When we start to exercise more intensely, so there's a spectrum, we eventually, very gradually, switch over from burning fats to burning more carbohydrates. So I mentioned phosphocreatine was most useful during intense type of activity, sprint type of exercise. And that's because at the highest exercise activity during the first few seconds, 10, 20 seconds of exercise, phosphocreatine is actually very important for maintaining our ATP levels because 
um, burning carbohydrates, burning fats cannot keep up with the demand for ATP. I know that will taper off, right? So you can't sprint at a very high rate of speed for a minute or two minutes, right? That's not going to happen. So the phosphocreatine stores are only useful during those first few seconds of exercise. So compare that to a marathon where you're running for hours. Phosphocreatine is not really going to give you the benefit that you need because all it's doing is acting as a buffer. Um, so phosphocreatine is only important for a few seconds, <laughs> um, you know, at most a minute versus uh, hours of running during a marathon. So that's why it's really important that people don't really blindly go and spend money on phosphocreatine and not really understand its mechanism when it's most useful.